was some issues with breaking up because of the storm and all the other things that are happening out there. So uh, just hoping that uh, everybody's got me there. I'm just going to go back over here and see if I can uh, make sure that we're all good. This is what happens sometimes, guys. When you're a one-man show and you're looking to grow, this is what happens overall. So um, just going to make sure that we're good to go. And there we go. We are good. We are good again. Okay, so we're just going to do this in two little sections then. So once again, uh, my name is Frank Ferragini, a.k.a. Frank the Flowers, uh, City TV's Breakfast Television. For those that are joining me right now, thank you very much for joining me as well this morning. Uh, a little bit of a problem there with some of the issues. I know that we have some thunderstorm activity in some areas this morning. We also had a lot of downed uh, power um, lines yesterday. So there has been some infrastructure damage around the province, and because of that, that may be the reason why we're having some issues in terms of uh, some of the things going up here. So I am back to getting some questions answered. And everybody here, breaking up periodically with Sega. It's a good rainy morning. There we go. So good morning. I've been trying crop rotation with my garden, but I found some years the pepper squash, et cetera, doesn't give as good yields as I have sunnier spots than others for my plots. Would you suggest continuing a crop rotation? So Elizabeth, when you can, you want to crop rotate. But if your sunniest spots are in areas, sun is the most important thing. Crop rotation is going to minimize disease and or insects. If you didn't have more so disease. So if you had a disease last year in that area, that sunny spot where your squash did well, I would avoid planting in that sunny spot um, and maybe going and rotating for that year. But if you had no disease and no issues, I would always plant squash, tomatoes, peppers, in the sunniest spot as possible. Squash, tomatoes, peppers, they need light units and heat units. The more light units they get, the more sunlight they get, the more heat they get, the better the yield. It is as simple as that. That's exactly what you need. Okay, now we got another little comment and or question. Uh, yeah, hey, Frankie, what is the name of the yellow petunia flower? Thank you. That's called bee's knees. So the yellow petunia that you saw me uh, show on City Line, which is a beautiful, the brightest yellow, is bee's knees. Bee's knees is one of the best yellow petunias that are available on the market that's out there. Um, we are getting a little, here we go, with the lilacs as well. Another question. My lilacs are beautiful right now, and the scent is awesome. I always love taking some lilacs, cutting them, and bringing them indoors. However, when you do that, just give them a little bit of shake so that you're not bringing any insects indoors. You can actually hang them upside down and just even hose them off and wash off any insects so you're not bringing insects indoors as well. Uh, here's another great question too, and this is more so with pest control. Can marigolds be planted in a pot with a tomato plant? Yes, indeed, they can. But marigolds are not going to do much for repelling many insects. Tomatoes, for instance, usually get a tomato hornworm. That's probably the most damaging insect that you want. And marigolds are not going to really repel that tomato hornworm. What I would plant in a pot beside a tomato versus a marigold is I would plant some basil or basil. That actually helps to repel aphids from the tomato plant. And that's a better companion than marigolds. Marigolds, planting marigolds around the exterior of a vegetable garden works really well, but as well planting nasturtiums. Nasturtiums, if you are growing your own food, nasturtiums are an edible flower. So really great for floral confetti. That's when you put it into salads. But as well, nasturtiums are what are known as a host plant. Nasturtiums attract insects to that space. And by attracting those insects to the space, those insects will stay on the nasturtium, eat the nasturtium, and stay away from everything else. So nasturtium is also another great companion plant that you can use. Um, just a comment we have here as well on coffee grounds. I scrape out all the coffee grounds from the pods and use grounds in my garden with eggshells and fireplace ashes, pods going to recycling. Okay, so eggshells, eggshells are gonna improve calcium. Calcium in the soil for tomatoes specifically will reduce blossom end rot around the base. That's great. Uh, the coffee grounds actually improve nitrogen into your soil, that's good. Wood ash will actually work as neutralizing the acidity in the soil. So putting these sparingly in your garden is very important. Not putting too much wood ash, not putting too much coffee grounds, you can put a lot of eggshells in there, won't do a difference, but just use the wood ash and the coffee grounds sparingly because sometimes you can actually put too much nitrogen in the soil, acidifying the soil too much. 
But even mixing all those together into a compost and making a compost from them is so, so great. Here we go with another one. Uh, when is the best, What? where is the best area for roses? I would like to try one. I have before, but I didn't live long. New gardener here. So there are several different varieties of roses, right? There's hybrid teas, grand flora, flora bundas, there's shrub roses, Canadian Explorer series roses, Griffin Buck roses. Uh, there's actually the, the new North uh, 44 parallel, the ones from Vineland, uh, which are great roses too. Um, so first off, what type of rose do you want? Roses will always do best in your sunniest space, so they need sunshine. Uh, if they're sheltered from wind, that is good, but good airflow, not in a packed garden because you're going to get more disease. If you're using any uh, grafted roses, so uh, a, hy a hybrid rose, a grandiflora and a floribunda are all grafted roses, and those graft points need to be held up and protected. If you want a really easy rose, look for a knockout rose or a griffin buck rose. Knockout rose is super easy. It's not a big bloom, but those are super easy for you. That can work out really well. Here we go. We got another good morning, Frankie. I have weeds that look like stars. Any ideas of what they are and how to get rid of them? Uh, this is for Georgia Pike. So if they are like a little weed that has a little white flower, uh, those guys there are just best to hand removal. A reminder with hand removing them is putting them immediately in a bag or in uh, even a, a pot, not a pot, but more of a bucket. Because if you're actually hand removing them and shaking those weeds, you're actually broadcasting more seed. So anytime that we're removing any flowering weeds, we actually want to make sure that we're removing them before they go to seed, so early on, and then we're putting them immediately into a bag and or some sort of container that can contain those weed seeds that are out there. After removing them, you can use a wood mulch to really help them with the mulch that happens. As well, straw mulch is super important. That straw mulch is something that you can use. You can actually buy straw mulch that you can use on your vegetable gardens to cut down the weeds in your vegetable gardens. You will be weeding more in the month of May and the month of June until those gardens fill out. Once the gardens fill out and take up all that void space, there won't be areas for weeds to grow. So in the beginning, we always have a little bit extra weeding that happens out there. Here we go with another question. And good morning to everybody. Hey, Frankie, how are you feeling since you have been in close contact with people? Thanks, Matthew. Yes, last week I was close contact with someone. Uh, and with that, for the remainder of the week, I was working from home uh, just to be safe. And I feel absolutely fine. Uh, I've been testing negative. I am, uh, you know, of course, triple vaxxed. I've already had COVID as well. But Matthew, thank you for asking. I feel fine. And I will be back to work on Tuesday, back in studio with BT on Tuesday. I'm so sad that I, got to, I missed the Niagara show as well. Cheryl Lynn King, Frankie, what should I use as a top dressing that is good quality and not full of twigs? There's so many different top dressings that you can use out there. If you're looking to really thicken your lawn, I really like Scott's 911 lawn response. That thing, like I can show you my back lawn and my front lawn at the home that I moved to. This is only my second growing season in this home. My lawn is thick. My lawn is full. I did hand removal of weeds. Uh, I used the 911 a couple times during the season. And my lawn, and then I fertilized, my lawn is bang on, bang on. There's many different other products that are out there. That's what I used with great success. And I'm telling you, man, they were great. So is there good top dressing? Yes. The key is if you're trying to find a soil, if you're buying bulk soil, and you don't want twigs, sticks, and stones in that soil, you're looking for a soil that's screened and shredded. So when you call up your bulk soil supplier, hi, I'm looking to top dress my lawn. Ask if the soil has been screened and shredded. That means it's gone through a filter and a shredder. Look at this, my camera, showing how messy my desk is today. Don't look. It is messy. There's a lot of stuff that's here. I'm just going to, this camera sometimes has a mind of its own. So we're just going to go in there and, and I'm going to lock it again. Boom. Look at that. I wasn't supposed to do that. It's me by holding my hand up. It actually shows it to go and do these different things. It's got a mind of its own. So ask for screened and shredded soil when you're purchasing soil. Uh, we got another question here as well. Good morning from Oakville. Love Oakville. A couple of good restaurants in Oakville. Coochie, really good. Uh, as well as there's the one plank I like that restaurant down there. My hostas have taken off uh, because of this warm weather. Everything did. We're going to start to see insect populations go too. I noticed yesterday something is eating them already. What can I do? Also, you're breaking up a bit here too. So it just seems like the stream quality that's here today is what we got going on. Um, if something's eating your hostas is generally is uh, slugs. 
Slugs can be controlled by many different things that are uh, available. There's a slug bait that you can purchase that you can put around. You can actually, if you like, uh, let's say that you went out and you ate a whole bunch of mussels and or clams. You can dry out those shells, crush them up, pulverize them, and put them around the base of your hosta. That's diatomaceous earth that you can use. Uh, slugs will not walk across copper. So if you have some old pennies that were made from copper, you can always put those around the base of your hostas. You can also take a, a container, like a shallow container, uh, like a Tupperware container, or even a margin container that's empty, sink it to ground level, put a little bit of beer and you'll find the slugs will go in there. And the key is, is to reduce slug populations is do not water your gardens at night. By watering your gardens at night, they're going to be warm, they're going to be wet. And by being warm and wet at night, that's when you're going to see more an increase of slugs because that's what they like in terms of the population. Okay, I just also want to show you guys one more time just in case you guys are joining right now. I just want to show you that one resource too, just a little bit about out there because now that insects, and we just talked about slugs that are there. Now that insects are starting to go into your hostas and into your vegetable plants and things like that, we want to make sure that you're nice and safe. So uh, you can go on to the Government of Canada's website. This is something that's put out there by Health Canada. If you go on to canada.ca and just type in pesticide safety, you can see that you know herbicides are used to control weeds, insecticides to control bugs, fungicides to control disease like black spots and things like that. You can take a look at all the different regulatory um, requirements that all these products that have out there uh, before even authorized for use. There's uh, concerns about the environment that go through and their registered project pro products. And we want you only to use registered products that are out there. So if you are purchasing and or buying things that are all on um, I really encourage you. Oh, I got to share that link again. Let me share that link again because I don't think I shared it. I was just talking about it. Um, here we go. I'm just going to share that again. So this is the, uh, the website again. Uh, it's Pesticide Safety, Government of Canada. So you just go to canada.ca, type in Pesticide Safety. You can learn a lot of different products that are available for you to use on your property. And if you're questioning whether a product is registered and or not, you can go on to that website and that website will help you out as well because sometimes people are buying products online right now and those products that are being purchased online are not coming from Canada. They're coming from other areas and they can cause and pose a threat not only to you, not only to your family, not only to your pets, not only to your neighbor's family and or pets, but the environment at large. So as we garden, we want to garden and we want to grow great things, but at the same time, we do want to be very, very, very safe. Um, I like this too. Here we go. I got another one. Maria, morning, Frank. Please check your messages. I need your advance. Thank you in advance. I wonder what that means. We'll figure that out. I love it. I love just to show everybody everything. Uh, a question from Grimsby. Can marigolds be planted in a pot with a tomato plant? We already answered that one. I think I just slid down here a bit. I'm just going to go and take a look at another question that we have as well. Yes, you've been breaking up. I missed what you had to say about aphids. They seem to be abundant this year. So aphids, if we're looking to control aphids, um, in aphid populations, because we got warm fairly quickly, first thing we can do is, is we're walking around our property. We see ants on a plant, and it's not a peony, because ants actually go on peonies naturally. But if we see ants on any plants, generally when you see an ant, you'll see an aphid. And those aphids um, will be eating and sucking away. And the reason why the ant's there is that but really the substance they leave in behind is like a honeydew that the ant really likes to enjoy to eat. First thing we can do is if we see them is we can just go and use a high pressure wash hose and we can actually spray them off. Next thing we can do is try to encourage and or release ladybugs into the space. The other thing that we can do is we can pick and squish. We can then also imply something like an insecticide. An insecticidal soap, many of them are available for sale. Those insecticidal soaps will smother the aphids that are on there. So those are three different, well, many different ways that you can uh, control. Uh, see, we got, so it's it's all over the map. So I think other people have bad connections as well, good connections. So I'm getting, I'm getting, you know, mixed reviews here. Like some people have great connections, some have bad connections. Uh, back from Hamilton Mountain, Kathy Wood, good morning to you as well. Uh, good morning. Uh, we have out there as well from Andrea, good morning to you. Uh, here's another question that we have this morning as well. Uh, Carol Jones, rose bush has black stems, no growth. It's dead. If you see a rose with black stems or white stems, those stems are dead. 
So if there's no growth in black stems at this time, Carol, it has gone up to that great compost pile in the sky. Here's another question. Is it safe to plant tomatoes? Last year we had sudden frost and lost them. Looking at the current seven day and 10 day forecast, I would go ahead and plant them. But you still, I've been wrong with weather before, uh, you still have to monitor for frost. And if we do have frost, if it's a smaller tomato plant, you can just take a bucket, put a bucket over the top of it that night, put a rock on top of that bucket so the bucket won't blow off, and that will give me enough protection for it. Uh, here we go again this morning for Ashley. I added some pics to the live event comments of our live lilac tree. I noticed some dead branches with some mushrooms and weird mossy bark. Is my tree dying and is there a chance of saving it? Ashley, I'll go back and take a look at those pictures thereafter. There is a chance of saving it. Any of the dead branches, remove those. Any dead or rotted areas, remove them. And you will also have some side shoots generally from a lilac coming out, which is new growth. We can actually take some of those side shoots and retransplant those side shoots and create a new lilac tree off the old lilac that will be there for you as well. Um, here's another question that we have here as well. Can I transplant hostas right now? Yes, Kelly, indeed. Hostas are super easy to transplant. You can almost transplant those at any of the time of year, but spring is an excellent time to be transplanting them. Here's a question from Branton. Uh, hi, Frankie, got some hibiscus seeds from Branton Horticultural Society. What's your recommendation on growing and germing them? So Frederick, uh, they take some time. If it's the perennial hibiscus, first thing I would do is to soak them 24 hours in soil. I would then do a direct sow at this time of the year directly out into your garden. Make sure you mark the area where you're going to sow them. And each little area, put three seeds and then space them out accordingly. I would space them out at least 12 inches in part because those hibiscus, the perennial hibiscus can get quite big. But at this time of the year, I would do a direct sow outdoors. Uh, and then once they start to germinate, if you get three plants, if they get perfect germination, then you can thin them out and actually replant those. But generally, you don't get perfect germination. So that's why we're putting three seeds per planting area, because we may get one out of the three to germinate, two out of the three to germinate, and if we're lucky, three out of three. So we're always putting a little bit extra that are there. Uh, here we go uh, with another, uh, Terry Baker. Oh, great idea. When tomatoes are ready, you have a perfect combo and pasta sauce. Tomato and basil work out really well together. I planted some basil yesterday and I actually took my uh, rosemary plant that I successfully overwintered and put it outside yesterday as well. Here's another question and or comment from Bruce. I grew petunias from cuttings, growing well. What do I need to get them to flower? Light. The amount of sunlight will really help them flower. If they're doing well, once you incorporate them outdoors, into that light, they'll start to bloom. You can actually fertilize them. It depends on the fertilizer you're using. Look for a little higher of a middle number and allowing them to dry them between watering, stressing that petunia a little bit, drying it between watering will make it set some flower buds that are out there. Uh, here's another question. I'm only gonna answer a couple more because I'm just over the 30 minute mark with the two. I'm having a hard time finding English lavender. I've seen other lavenders, but I like English lavender the best. Are they not popular now? My 18 year old, Oh, my 18 year old one has died and I want to replace it. So it depends. There are many different varieties of lavender and there are many different varieties of English lavender. Uh, the lavender is you're looking for hardiness zone in your area. Uh, I would look at perennials.com as a website. Perennials.com as a website for some of the different varieties of lavender that are available and which one is more of an English looking lavender. There are some of the lavenders out there that don't look like English types. Um, but uh, you're looking for hardiness zone. There's many different varieties that are available. It's just finding them. I would go to a good independent garden center and, and ask and inquire what English lavender variety they would recommend for your area for its hardiness zone for it to come back overall. Uh, here we go. Hey, Frankie, how are you feeling? Uh, that's Matthew again. I already said, Matthew, how I'm feeling. Uh, here we go again. Hi, Frankie. What are good indoor plants for home that does not have a lot of natural light? Great question. So homes that don't have a lot of natural light, you still need some natural light, but low light loving indoor plants include peace lily, spathophyllium, fantastic. Diefenbachia, fantastic. Dracaena marginata, fantastic. Even some of the monsteras will do well in low light. And then ZZ plant, Zemifolia. But probably the number one one I would try is either peace lily or Diefenbachia. Those are the two selections that I would go for for you. We're gonna go for one more question. Uh, again, I love the miracle shaken feed for flowering shrubs. Is this the best time for application? Carla, yes, indeed. Shaken feeds are a slow release fertilizer. 
approved by Health Canada as well. Uh, they are applied at this time of the year and they will slowly release for up to three months. There are shaken feed fertilizers for tree and shrub, there's general purpose, and there's even one for tomatoes uh, and vegetable and fruit plants as well. That's the one with the red lid, but those guys are fantastic. So once again, I'm just going to do another reminder to everybody out there as well. Uh, we're just going to go to this Chrome tab again. If you have some chance, you know, and you want to learn a little bit more about some of the different things that you can use in your home garden, and you want to learn more about those that are safe to use and some of the stringent and strict regulations that the current insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides that are available for sale, uh, the, the kind of the safety that they go through overall, uh, a ton on this website, which is that Canada.ca. And a reminder, everybody in the industry, when it comes to us growing plants, we all want everybody to be safe. We want you to be successful, but we want you to be safe. And for myself, I want you to be healthy. Uh, I am somebody out there that promotes gardening because I think it's good for well-being. I think it's good for our environment. And I also think it's good for us to eat better. And I think it's beautiful. I actually think it's one of the best things we can do for our soul. I think gardening feeds the soul. And that's why I love to promote gardening. And that's why I'm here each and every Sunday, 9 to 9.30. Sorry for some of the technical difficulties for today. We did our best. Sometimes what we have to do is make lemonade out of lemons. And I hope that's what we did for you today. And a reminder, gardening is always better than therapy. And the reason why, I joke about this. Of course, if you're not feeling good, go see a therapist. But if you can, get out there and garden. Because at the end of the day, you feel good and you get tomatoes. To all my friends out there, I hope you guys have a wonderful day.